May I begin by saying that I'm delighted to be here and to what I will do in one of my, thanks very much, in my early slides is indeed pick up the theme that Ewan Means mentioned in his opening address. Um, when there weren't many people on the globe, it didn't much matter what we did. Today, it matters enormously. The system is already highly integrated. Energy, food, plant life and other animal life, climate, water, each impacts the other. And it didn't, human beings didn't actually have that much effect until we got to our present size and growing. And today, energy, food, fresh water, plants and so on, we are affecting the lot. And indeed, human effects on our uh, quest for energy, affecting the climate, and indeed food, um, affecting plants and all sorts of other life. And so we can no longer simply say we can confine our thoughts to energy. We have to, at every stage, think of the bigger system. And the system is big. If we just look at the growth of human population over the last 12,000 years, from minus 10,000 to the today here, you can see we have this massive rapid growth in the last uh, 500 years. And you know, the paleontologists of the future, looking at human fossils and looking at the record, will simply see this as a species which appears to have appeared instantaneously and then pervaded every single environment on Earth. It is actually quite astonishing and it's unique. Now, the trouble is that all of these people use energy. And this is a slightly curious plot, which it is worth looking at. Population plotted vertically and total energy use expressed in terms of barrels of oil equivalent uh, per year plotted horizontally. And oddly enough, I couldn't actually find one of these plots on the internet. I was certain someone must have done it, but I couldn't, so this is mine. But you see this curious caterpillar heading upwards. And the changes in slope, of course, reflect changes in world economic conditions. If you go to, for example, 1978, the first major oil hit, you find that population continued to grow, but oil use went down. And then the slope steepens again as things become more prosperous. And each of these little hiccups indicates, uh, reflects the behavior of the world economy. One of the worrying things about this, you might say, well, you would expect more people uh, and so more energy use. If use increase of use in energy was simply proportional to the number of people, that is what the slope would be. And what the actual slope tells us is that we are actually, um, that the demand for energy is growing about 50% faster than the population. And it's just worth bearing that in mind when we think that this is headed up towards 9 billion. So we have a problem. Now, the <coughs> excuse me, organizers, I think quite appropriately, said they were not going to have a session on climate change. But particularly the keynote speakers were invited to talk about climate change in the context of what they were on about. And indeed, I was really asked to think about climate, uh, carbon capture and storage and its impact on the use of fossil fuels. But I do think it is worthwhile talking about climate change a certain amount, partly because, particularly in the English-speaking world, and I think primarily in the English-speaking world, there is quite a kickback against climate change, against the theory of climate change. And some of our newspapers in the UK and some of those in the US and television channels are very, very hostile and say that uh, adopting um, climate change policies to manage our energy is, lud is a ludicrous waste of resources and time. So forgive me um, if we uh, talk a little bit about climate change. Now, I'm going to do this slightly differently from the way in which it is normally done. And I ask you now to think about the four terrestrial planets, Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury. 
And up here on the top left-hand corner, plotted horizontal, horizontally is millions of kilometers starting from the sun. Um, and you have the plotted vertically, the irradiance, the solar heating that each of those planets receives. And clearly, Mercury closest to the sun gets most, Mars furthest from the sun gets least. And to a first approximation, you would expect the temperatures of those planets to be approximately proportional to their, the irradiance that they receive. But that isn't quite the case, because two of those planets, Earth and Venus, are warmer than you would expect. And if you look at the temperatures down here, you see Mercury, which is close to the Sun, which is, is 400. Venus, which is further away, is 460. And Venus is about 400 degrees warmer than you would expect. Earth is about 15 degrees warmer than you would expect. And, of course, um, John Tyndall in the 19th century did his experiment at the Royal Institution in London, and he showed that trace amounts of methane and CO2 and water could have a very powerful greenhouse effect. And indeed, he was, the I think, the first one quantitatively to argue that the fact that the Earth was a little bit warmer than one would have expected given its distance from the sun was due to its greenhouse. So let's have a look at that. And it turns out that the two um, planets that have abnormal temperature distributions unexpected are Venus and Earth. And Venus has a thick atmosphere, which is 95% carbon dioxide. Earth has an, uh, has an atmosphere which is predominantly nitrogen um, and oxygen with a little bit of CO2 and methane and water. And we have a modest greenhouse effect. But we are the planet which is sometimes called the Goldilocks planet because our atmosphere, our greenhouse, is just right. Um, we, by just right, we mean that um, it is right, it is appropriate for water to exist as liquid, as vapour, and as solid. And that means that Earth as we know it, that life as we know it on Earth is possible. And really the question comes down to, regardless of whether we like to adopt or believe the extremely clever and sophisticated computer models, whether well, under these circumstances it's right to play with the controls of our greenhouse by adding more CO2. And I find that this is an argument which people who may be unconvinced um, by uh, complex calculations which they have to take for granted, they find this a little bit more convincing. Um, we then look, for example, at more recent changes. And you're all familiar with this uh, diagram showing the retreat of um, summer ice in the Arctic. And these lines which you see here, here represent earlier extents of summer ice um, before 2007, which is what, um, the diagram on which this is based. And if we look at the area of that ice down here as a function of time, plotted horizontally, 1953 back here, 2000, I think, and seven there, and area plotted vertically, I'm sure you can't read the numerals, um, it's important to recognize that if, for example, we just had those little bits of record, um, we saw that, we'd say, well, there's not much change. The ice is constant. If we had just that bit, we might say, well, actually, ice is, area is increasing. If we had that, we would say ice is decreasing. The important thing to recognize is that climate is very complicated. Superimposed on the natural greenhouse, which I have already described, you have a whole range of other phenomena with their own cyclicities associated with them. 
Uh, I'm not going to go into these now, they're fascinating, but you start with the solar cycle, and at least the main solar cycle is 11, is 11 years, but we have longer so solar cycles. And then we have a series, a series of cycles asso associated with the rotation of the Earth and the slight perturbations of its orbit. So the message is that by looking at short pieces of record, whether you're measuring temperature or anything else, it's very difficult to say anything serious about the, about the climate and climate change. And that is why um, those people who say, well, the temperature hasn't risen for 10 years, for five years, what have you, yeah, I'm quite prepared to believe it. It doesn't affect the fundamental physics, which I showed you, the planets. Um, there are things that you can't really argue about very much. For example, the um, measurement of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, which first began to be measured in the late 50s by Keeling at Scripps, and plotted vertically as CO2 from up to 400 there, 275 parts per million, and years horizontally, starting from 1960 to 2010. And that steady rise with its annual fluctuation, which is now well known, showed on it. And some of you will have spotted that um, last month, um, the concentration for the first time reached 400 ppm. So we're actually up here now. Now, of course, if you have CO2 in the atmosphere, um, two thirds of the surface of the Earth is ocean. And so you get significant solution um, of um, CO2 in the oceans. And this is measured here, um, just a little bit to the north of Hawaii. Now, if you increase the CO2 in the oceans, obviously you affect their acidity. And this, a little curve down here, shows the decrease in pH, therefore the increase in salinity, and pH is plotted down the right here, steadily decreasing. Now, why should we bother about that? Well, again, I'm not going to talk about it at length, but I am going to point, point out that calcium carbonate is extremely important in the oceanic food chain. And just as one example, this little beast here, the krill, which is allegedly, but in terms of body mass, the most abundant creature on Earth, um, which teams they range in size from a few millimetres to centimetres and really abound in the South Atlantic. They're right at the bottom of the food chain. They live on these little um, minute um, pla uh, planktonic organisms here which photosynthesise, but they feed the finned fish. Finned fish fill turtle, fe feed turtles and other higher animals and they indeed feed the killer, killer whales. But of course, Krill are also the main food of filter feeding species right up, including a lot of the whales. Now, the important thing is if you increase the acidity of the oceans, um, you actually make life very hard for organisms which depend on calcium carbonate, as do the krill, and as do all sorts of all the other organisms which you, um, which you know about. Potentially, and I think this is under-investigated under and not yet fully understood, this could be as important for us as indeed the broader climate change um, behaviour which we'll be talking about in a minute or two. So, the other thing that we know is that sea level is rising. We've got quite good sea level records now for about the last 150 years. And Ewan means... I think very appropriately, chose a series of nautical examples in his first, in his opening statement. And indeed, because the oceans and ships have been so important over the years, sea levels have been very important and measured in ports. And going back to about 1860, um, something like that, you have this steady rise in sea level um, up, to the present, up to the present day year 2010, about here. And this vertical scale is in millimetres. This is an arbitrary reference level. So you've got about 300 millimetres vertically there. And it's a steady rising. And it appears to be, at least in part, associated with continental um, melt of continental ice, as in the Arctic, uh, sorry, in Greenland, and 
in the Antarctic <coughs> continental ice sheets, but the greater part is simply warming of the oceans and thermal expansion. So that's another thing that we know is happening. So what do we know? And coming sort of summarizing the bit on climate change. We know that we've got a rise in atmospheric CO2. We know that we've got marine acidification. We know there's a threat to the marine food chain, to shellfish, and indeed to corals. And we also know that there is ocean warming and we've got sea level rise. And we, this clearly gives a threat of flooding. People who live on uh, particularly Pacific Oceanic islands are very conscious of this, but not to mention the coast of Bangladesh and places like that. So I think that those are things that we can know and we can say are pretty much incontrovertible. On the basis of theory, we predict rapid climate change dis disruption, um, rainfall, water supply and agriculture being disrupted, droughts, storms, and population migration as a consequence. So I think there are really quite serious consequences, but we have to recognize that these are deductions, very plausible deductions, based on theory. So I think the bottom line on this is that if someone wants to deny anthropogenic climate change, they really have to come up with an alternative um, explanation for the temperature distribution of the terrestrial planets, which is really based on the greenhouse effect, and indeed our life on Earth seems to be made possible by the greenhouse. Okay, now let's move from that into fuels. Um, today, something like 80% of the Earth's energy comes from coal and from oil uh, and from gas. Uh, sorry, you can't really see that. That is the gas bit there. Um, and the big change, of course, in recent, over the last decade, it's actually been around for longer than that, but it's really become particularly prominent during the last few years, is the arrival of shale gas. And I'm going to say a little bit about it because it has had a dramatic effect. And this is no more than an illustration of indeed the uncertainty of the phenomenon to a degree. Um, plotted vertically, sorry, plotted vertically, we have um, shale gas reserves in inverted commas for a number of countries, US, China, Argentina, Mexico, and South Africa. And the yellowish, the yellowish columns are derived from the BP Global Statistics 2009, wouldn't be terribly different um, today. The vertical columns were the supposed shale gas reserves of um, those countries. And you can see that the important thing is that although the US and China have each got enormously more, um, countries which really had very little presence in the gas area, like Argentina, Mexico, and South Africa, really have very, are supposed to have very significant um, reserves. Now, I think that there is a great deal of uncertainty associated with this. Um, it really is just very hard to tell. The shale gas industry is still in its infancy. And <coughs> there is no doubt at all about the massive effect it has had on the US economy and the US fuel situation. And as people have pointed out, the US, US geology is, ne is not unique. The US geological situations are re reproduced in many countries. So why shouldn't we all have shale gas? Well, probably a lot of us do. But what is different about the US is that the commercial situation is different. Insofar as the owner of the land, owner of the property, is owner of any mineral rights or any mineral preserves underground. And this means that, though that the landowner is free to make a deal with whatever company he or she wants. That is not true in the majority of countries, where the underground rights tend to belong, belong to the government or, or the state. But this has led to the enormous blossoming of the US shale gas industry. Uh, a lot of people have got hurt. Cowboys have come in and done all sorts of undesirable things, as many of you know. But it has got the uh, industry going. And any of you who are familiar with the situation in this country knows that because the government is involved in all sorts of detail, we have inquiries, we have reports, 
and we have a great deal of extraordinary glacially slow action. The other point is that worth pointing out, which is not often emphasized, is that shale gas is, quotes, expensive. In any natural resource has a cost associated with its extraction. Um, <clears throat> and shale gas is right up at the top end of the cost of getting gas out of the ground. So it is intrinsically expensive because you have to do all sorts of things to get it out which you don't normally have to do. It certainly has increased world reserves and really very importantly, it's widely distributed. So what does all that mean? Gas is attractive because gas-fired power stations are about half as expensive to build as their coal equivalent. And indeed, in today, the US is the one large country that is showing reduction in its emissions, and that is because coal-fired power stations are being taken out of service and displaced by gas-fired power stations because they're cheaper to build and cheaper to run. And the consequence is a net reduction in emissions. Um, and of course, as you're aware, the greenhouse gas emissions associated with gas are about half those of control, coal. The other important thing in an energy system context is that gas power is dispatchable. It means you can have it when you want it. You can switch it on and off. It's not entirely clear what effect carbon capture and storage, which I'll talk about in a minute, would have on that. But it is uh, a question. And the other important thing is that the traditional suppliers no longer have their monopoly uh, over the global gas supply. And it's a much more open gas market than it was a couple of years ago. And if equally true, I think that it's likely that local environmental effects of shale gas, which actually dogged some of the early exploitation in the US, I think that they can be satisfactorily managed. But there are problems. I've already said, cost, it's expensive to get out. And the important, another important thing to recognize is that gas is the least transportable of the fossil fuels. Coal, you just dig out and you put into a truck or a boat, move it somewhere. In order to move gas round, you've either got to build an expensive pipeline or you've got to liquefy it and put it in a tanker and transport it somewhere else. And that can be a significant fraction of the cost of the gas as a whole. So the people who really benefit from shale gas are those who have it and can feed it directly into their gas grid. And that is really why it's so important in the US and why it is currently giving a real shot in the arm to the US economy. And, but it is worth bearing in mind that currently shale gas extraction exploitation has a high water demand and in some places this may actually limit um, its exploitability. Now let's see how and bring some of this together. Um, it's worth looking at this plotted vertically are annual emissions and note its emissions in terms of millions of tons of CO2 and plotted horizontally years from 2005 to 2035. And you've got the emissions associated with coal, gas, and oil. And these obviously total to 100, but coal gives, although it's 44% of emissions, is 28% of all energy. Gas, 20% of coal of emissions, 22% of all energy, oil, 36 and 33. So these only total to about 80% because, of course, there are other energy sources. Now, where are we today? We're there. And clearly, this is based at the, uh, the EIA projection and is really driven by the sort of figures that I showed you right at the very beginning, increasing world population, increasing energy demand. Now, um, this is where we do not want to be. This uh, is retaking the IPCC uh, predictions. We do really do want to keep out of that danger zone. And as you can see, we're just on the edge of it uh, at the moment, and we're headed right up into it. So the question really is, how can we avoid getting into that and at the same time meet the world's increasing energy requirements. Well, we can see down here at the bottom 
Oil is significant. Oil is used mostly these days for transport, and there are very good reasons why it should. Really, the internal combustion engine depends on it, and until we, and although we can find alternatives for surface transport, um, for aviation, alternatives are very difficult indeed. Um, one possibility is to substitute gas for coal. Now, gas has only half the emissions, and we know that gas is more readily available. And you can see that, in principle, if we were able to convert all our coal-fired um, power generation coal use to gas, probably this curve would come down to something like that, and we'd be out of trouble. But, of course, that's ridiculous. We're not going to be able to do that. We're just looking at the numbers. So the, another possibility is to think about carbon capture and storage, namely the technology by which we capture CO2 uh, at the point of generation, for example, at a power station, refinery, or big industrial source. We trap it, and we trap it in some way, and we immobilize it. Now, typically, we're talking of trapping 90% uh, of the CO2. Now, if we were able to do that, you can see on coal, that would bring us right down to here, and gas would bring us down to here, and in fact, it would bring the combined emissions way down to something like that. So, in principle, if we can apply CO2, it can, it is a get out of jail card. Um, now, I haven't spoken about other energy sources. Nuclear, we can increase nuclear, we can increase renewables, but given the massive investment um, that we have in fossil fuels and the inability to change our infrastructure really fast, if we can make carbon capture and storage work, it really will be at least a temporary um, solution. What our energy sources will be in 50, 60 years' time who can say? We may have nuclear fusion, we may have all sorts of things. But at the moment, I think that that diagram presents us with a real challenge and a problem. Now, carbon capture and storage, I've mentioned already, this is simply a cartoon to show how it works. You know, you have, the idea is that you have coal going into a power station where you capture the CO2, and that is around about 70% of the cost. Um, on present technology, you transport it in a pipeline, which is about another 10%, um, and then you um, put it underground, perhaps into an abandoned gas field or a saline aquifer or something like that, and that's another 20% of the cost. The problem is that present technology would increase um, electricity costs by somewhere between 30 and 50% to about the cost of offshore wind, just to give you a feeling for the, the, the parities. And, coming back to water again, water, in, water requirement is increased by around 30%, another important constraint. And just to look at some of the places where this has been done, looking at the underground um, activity, the Norwegians have been putting uh, CO2 underground at Sleipner, where it is separated from produced um, methane gas, which is rich in CO2. They separate the CO2 from the methane. Um, there is Sleipner. This is the Sleipner field in the Norwegian sector of the North Sea. Uh, they're producing from down here. And then it is being re-injected into this sandstone uh, at this level. And this experiment has been going on, probably, I'm not sure, five, six or longer years now, and seems to be very satisfactory, and a great deal has been learned. Um, at the, to get a feeling for what is involved at a power station, this EU uh, facility, which was built at Eschberg um, in Denmark, and incidentally, the top of that stack is supposed to be the highest point in Denmark, um, the, um, it's worth looking, this is, a, as you say, a, a small coal-fired power station. Look at the area with the ring around it now. And I'm going to show you within that ring what was necessary to add in terms of footprint for the carbon capture and storage. 
and you can see that. It is a big new building. It increases the footprint of the power station by over 25%. It's of the same order as desulfurization, um, but it, it is big. And clearly, if you're going to retrofit this, as one may have to under all sorts of circumstances, um, you've got to have space to do it. Now, clearly, there was space here. So, um, you might say, well, all right, you've got the technology, why hasn't all this been done? Well, the answer is, of course, that in Europe, uh, we had a very clever scheme, the emissions trading scheme, which was based on, if you like, a, an escalating market-driven tax on uh, CO2 emissions. I'm not going to go into this. I don't think you don't really want to get into the intri intricacies of this. But it basically did not take into account the possibility of the major recession, which we have now um, experienced. CCS would begin to be the economically attractive way forward for a coal-fired power station uh, owner or the owner of a big CO2 emitting facility when the uh, carbon price got up to 80 or 90 or even 100 euros per tonne. In contrast, you can see that it went from a high of around about 30 in 2008 to a few euros per tonne, which is where we are now. In other words, there is no um, emissions trading scheme incentive at all for anyone to do the things that we're talking about. And this is really why um, CCS has foundered in Europe. Very sad, but this is the fact. We, I mean, a lot of government would hate me saying this, but things are just staggering along in a very inconsequential way at the moment. So let's go to a different, let's move to China, where things are actually happening, I think, a lot, in a lot more interesting way. That, for interest, is not a black and white picture. It's a colour picture taken in winter. And that is a coal-driven steam train, uh, the kind of train that I actually went, on, went to school on um, 60 years ago. And it's pulling a track uh, full of trucks full of coal. Um, and I, I'm not sure of this figure, but I was told that more than 50% of the freight on Chinese railways is coal, being moved from mines um, to power stations. And China is still building coal-fired power stations uh, as if they were going out of fashion. The thing is that China is a very rapidly developing country, and you have to recognize that roughly a third of the population in central and northwestern China does not have access to mains electricity. And one of the Chinese government's highest priority is to get mains electricity as fast as possible to these areas that don't have it. And the simplest way of doing that is to build coal-fired power stations fast. And that is what is, do is happening. And China builds the equivalent of the whole UK generating capacity about every six months. It is a massive program. I should say that in parallel, nuclear is moving ahead very fast. Renewables are moving ahead very fast. And the position of the Chinese government is that, yes, we are contributing to global emissions, um, but we have to go up before we can come down again. And I think it's extremely instructive to look at the most recent Chinese five-year plan, where, which was not two years ago now, it was released, where no fewer than one-third of the objectives relate to energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, and energy management. In other words, China is taking climate change very seriously. I believe that China has the most technologically aware government in the world. They understand the science of climate change, and even more, they understand that if climate change theory is right, China is going to be one of the big losers, because China depends on water from the Himalayas. And if that um, precipitation in the Himalayas does not come down as snow, as it does at the moment, but comes down significantly more as rain, what you'll get is massive um, spring floods in Western China, and you won't get a steady flow throughout the year. So every indication I have through talking to officials in China and so on is that climate change is appreciated, but we have to 
recognize that in, the, in terms of their internal problems. And this is another slightly odd but interesting picture. Plotted vertically is per capita um, energy use. And plotted horizontally is population in billions. And what I've got here is the population of China in 1965, around about little under um, three quarter, about three quarters of a billion, rising progressively as we come up to 2000. But round about in the late 90s, per capita energy use turned a corner and began to eat, uh, become significantly greater. In other words, the Chinese middle class on the East Coast um, began to grow. Now, China today is somewhere like that, and the developed countries today are somewhere like that, uh, at round about 0.9 of a billion people, and with something like three or four times the per capita use of um, fossil fuels than China. Now, the intriguing thing about this diagram is that if you multiply a number of people, which you've got horizontally, um, by a per capita use of fuels, which you've got vertically, you end up with, given that they're predominantly from fossil fuels, you end up with a rectangle which is proportional to their emissions. If you do that for China, uh, a little while back, um, that is what you see. As we go forward to 2015, it moves up to that. And you can see that by 2015, you would expect Chinese emissions to be pr roughly equivalent to those of the developed world. On the other hand, if, we can, if China can put carbon capture and storage on that, it can come down to that, and the same with the emissions of the developed countries. This gives you just a feel for the importance of CCS. So the challenges, the cost of CCS uh, must come down for it to be generally applicable. We can afford it in the West, it cannot be afforded in the developing countries. And the present generation of CCS technologies, if applied to gas, is, which is where we look at them in this country, make load following That's really quite difficult. But you don't get a second generation of CCS unless you've got a first. And a range of new CCS tech technologies are about to come up. There are new ways of concentrating CO2 at power stations, which are very different from what I showed you back there. And there is the possibility of not having to pump CO2 underground, but to actually immobilize it in solids. A more very interesting work. So there, is new, there are new possibilities on the horizon. So what are my conclusions? First, I think that without CCS, the carbon targets that we have currently are probably unattainable. I don't see any other way. Uh, just conceivable with a combination of nuclear and, re and renewables, but it's very difficult to see. CCS on fossil fuel plant would be a massive global industry. Don't underestimate it. It would be an enormous industry, comparable to the existing fossil fuel industry. So it's going to be big. And major cost reductions, as I said, are needed for CCS to be adopted worldwide. There are promising new technologies, but you must have political commitment to drive them as well. Without political commitment on behalf of our leaders, it won't happen. And China, I believe, may turn out to be both the, world, both the CCS champion for the world and indeed the climate change champion for the world. And so with CCS, Unconventional gas may indeed become conventional. Thank you very much.